I'm very excited. I've had so much fun going back and reading this again. Um, and really, you know, when you come back to a book like this after so many years, you, you see so much more uh, that you missed the first time around. So it's been, it's been very, very good and fun for me. Yes. It's, uh, you know, it was complicated the first time I read it. Yeah. And it's complicated the second and third and fourth time I read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it, it's a complicated book. Um, but you know, the, you know, the mistake I made the first time. No, what's that? What, it, well, every time he mentioned a new text, like a new novel or something, you know, um, I would like stop and think, oh, I have to read that novel in order to understand what he's talking about. Um, and that's not true. I, I did that with like the red and the black. Uh -huh. uh, I did, And then when I saw how long um, both Don Quixote and Proust's novel, you know, remembrance of things past there was no way i was reading those things and so i realized though that he does such a good job renee gerard does such a good job of just pulling out enough of the giving you enough information about the characters yep uh, that and the and the situation that that you can follow along uh, with him, and that if you actually do decide to go back and read those things again, or for the first time, right? Um, those novels will mean so much more because you've gotten his perspective on them. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that was that's kind of what I realized going through the second time was that I just made it harder than it had to be. I read <laughs> parts of Don Quixote after reading Deceit, Desire in the novel. Did you? Yeah, and it just all kind of fits together. I mean, Don Quixote, I guess, is the mimetic theory novel, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just after reading uh, Deceit, Desire in the novel, it just all fits. When Doesn't I it? read Don Quixote, yeah. Yeah, from like the very yeah. first page, so. Well, and I think um, that novel is sort of like the the father of novels. I mean, it's like known as the first modern novel, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So that was kind of cool. So, I mean, that's part of why we're, you know, we're wanting to read this book together. Um, Adam, because it was re really meaningful to you and me. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's helped us understand mimetic theory too, but it's, uh, it's that book that started Renee's career and started his his development of mimetic theory into this very full-blown, very well-developed thing about human relationships. Amazing that he wrote it at age 37, by the way. Yeah. And here I am at age 37, and I got nothing. <laughs> and you I'm so to glad to be talking with you about this book, Suzanne, because... As much as I read it, there it's still really hard. It's still really hard to understand. So that's one of the reasons that I wanted to uh, discuss it with you is um, is to maybe get a better grasp at what's going on in this book. So, well, it really does help to wrestle it out with someone yeah. because yeah, I mean, and that's one thing I want to tell uh, the viewers here. Um, we're hoping that you'll. Um, you know, post questions and so forth. And um, if Adam and I don't know the answer, which is might likely, very likely that we don't know the answer, we know people who will know the answer. So we, we can, uh, you know, continue this conversation and, and, um, and talk to the real experts who, who are the academics doing, doing the work with mimetic theory right now. Um, but really this book is, it, it's in one sense easy to understand because it's about our everyday personal experiences. It's about desire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's about how we um, focus our desires, how we decide what we want and, and what we're going to pursue and, and go after 
you know, and it's, um, it's part of our everyday world because we're filled with um, advertisers trying to tempt us into wanting the thing that they have, you know? Right. <laughs> uh, and so advertising is one of those things that's ubiquitous. It's just all around us all the time. We, it, we just don't give any second thought to it. But it really tells, a, it has a big insight about how desire works. Yeah, Gerard calls it triangular desire, right? That's the big term that he uses in this book. And so, yep. I, I, you know, one of the things that's helpful, I think, for me in talking about this book is to state what um, what he's trying to debunk, right? Yeah. Which, oh, exactly. Which is, which is this idea that our desires are formed somewhere within us, like... It's the whole myth of autonomy, is what he's is what he's trying to get at, right? Oh, absolutely, and and it it really sort of explains this thing, you know, like we'll we all have this experience. It it's so common. It has this name, buyer's remorse. Yeah, you know that we we are so sure that we absolutely have to have this thing, you know, a pair of shoes or a a purse or or a car mm -hmm. or a, you know bigger house or whatever it is. And then we get it and we're like, mm, well, this is just not giving me the kick. <laughs> you know, going to give me. Right. Um, so we regret. So why is that? If our desires are coming up from within us spontaneously and we're fulfilling our heart's desires, why are we so disappointed uh, at, at times like that? And that's, that's one of the things that um, that's like the practical, uh, application of understanding mimetic desire is to really understand where are our desires coming from mm -hmm. what advertisers know that we're not always conscious of um and how can we become conscious of it yeah and then really be able to find uh more authentic desires rather than chasing things that are going to disappoint us um yeah, I mean, so, especially in our culture, we almost live in the matrix of advertising. Like, it's everywhere. You go on the computer, and it's there. You go driving, and billboards are everywhere. Television, it's all its all around us in ways that are trying to direct us to uh, to buy stuff. Um, and, here's, and here's how it works, right? Like, uh, it's not really about the thing. It's about somebody modeling the thing. Right. Somebody who is like holding the can of beer or or the the watch, right? And saying, "Hey, if you want to be like me, uh, buy this thing, and you'll be as fulfilled as the person who's modeling it." Yeah, I mean, Gerard says explicitly in in Deceit, Desire, in the novel that the best advertisements aren't trying to convince you of the value of their product; mm. they're trying to convince you that someone else wants it. Right. And so, and, and Renee's big claim in this book is that the great novelists, what makes them great is that they're revealing the role of the mediator. Hmm. They're not feeling it. So many uh, works of fiction, he says, reflect the um, effects of the mediator of triangular desire, but the, the mediator remains hidden. Yeah. Um, these more rom he calls them more romantic um, books. Uh, the French title, the book was published first in French in 1961, and the French title was uh, Romantic Lie and Novelistic Truth. Mm -hmm. so, romantic stories, you know, where two people see each other across a crowded room and fall in love, and then there's a comedy that ensues because all these obstacles come up and they miss each other and can't quite connect and at the end they overcome all the obstacles and they live happily ever after that's the romantic version of triangular desire because the mediators are hidden mm. you never see uh how the desire is being um directed by some other third party so let's let's get into that because um what we really want to do, so let's outline a little bit of what we're going to do. I think um, it would help folks to know 
where we hope to go in the next hour. And if we don't get there, we'll do, you know, we'll oh, good. Do, do it another time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what we wanted to do was look at the first three chapters of Deceit, Desire in the novel um, and try and point out some of the big ideas that are in there. That if this is the first time you're encountering mimetic theory, it will really help to know some of this vocabulary uh, and, and where Renee's going with it, you know. Um, so the the first part of our talk today, Adam, we're going to just trace how desire works, how this triangular desire works. Um, and then we're going to look at two different types of triangular desire that are really important in um, mimetic theory. The first is external mediation, mm. and the second is internal mediation, and they're just different aspects of the mediator, you know. Um, and then we'll end up, if we get, to, if we get all the way through that, um, we're going to end up by looking at um, our conclusion will be what Rene says about novelistic conclusions. He says the great novelists are all writing about the same thing and their conclusions are about the same thing. Mm. Which doesn't mean they're all identical. There's a great diversity and creativity about how you express this unity. Yep. But he's the novels have a unity, and that's what he's exploring in Deceit, Desire in the novel, and that's the evidence he's trying to accumulate mm -hmm. um, for us by showing all these, you know, anecdotes and character descriptions and so forth. Right. So, so let's look at the triangle, Adam. Okay, can I tell you a little uh, story about triangular desire? Little, this is a very mundane, Please. everyday story. I was out shopping for shoes uh, four years ago or something, right? And uh, I was walking uh, across the shoe store and I found this really great brown pair of shoes, like almost exactly what I was wanting. Uh, they had like these stripes on them that made them look kind of unique and kind of cool. So I picked it up and I thought, mm, maybe there's a better shoe and I put it back in its place. Well, then I walked on down the aisle and then some other guy came over and started picking up the shoe and looking at it. And I thought, oh, that son of a you-know-what had better put those shoes back because those are my shoes, man. And uh, he eventually did. And I went running back for those shoes <laughs> and picked them up and bought them. Uh, and so his, like, um, his desire for these shoes just increased mine, right? Right. So and it was a casual desire. I mean, he just was looking at them. Right, he was just looking at them. Um, and so in this, like, you talk about the mediator. Yeah. Uh, and this is kind of like one of the problems with Deceit, Desire in the novel is that Gerard uses these big terms like mimesis, like mediator, like internal desire and external desire and metaphysical desire and things. And it's kind of like, what are you talking about? Um, so this, I think, is an example of a mediator, somebody who comes in and points your attention, either consciously or unconsciously. In this case, he didn't know that I was looking at these shoes before. He just happened to pick them up. Um, but advertisers do this consciously, like what we were just talking about. Um, yeah. So here's my mediator coming in, picking up these shoes. My my desire for the shoes gets heightened because somebody else is looking at them, and I go running to them, picking them up. But this gets... This also gets to the point where, you know, when you ever, whenever you buy something and you're just like, let down, <laughs> as you say, buyer's remorse. I wore those shoes, I think, 10 times. Yeah. Like, they really weren't all that great. Um, right. So, <laughs> that, right. that's that's the, uh, in uh, biblical terms or Christian terms, that's what idolatry is, right? Like, you give... You give so much to the object, and really, it just it can't fulfill its promises, and it just totally lets you down. Well, exactly, and that's um, the progression of that becoming sort of enslaved to the role of the mediator right. uh, is the trajectory that Renee's going to follow in this discussion of how, you know, okay, it's silly, so you wasted 60 bucks on a pair of shoes, whatever. Um, it's a silly mistake. Um, but if you don't become conscious of it, it, it becomes a, a sickness of the soul, of the spirit, because you do fall into 
being enslaved to other people's desires, and then you completely lose sight right. of what it is you really want, you know. Right. Because, you know, normally, you know, let's look at this, um, the, because Gerard begins the book by sort of taking us to task on how we normally understand desire. Yeah. Uh, which is as a straight line. Yes. Uh, connecting me, the desiring subject, mm -hmm. to the object, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we think either, our, like you said, you were saying, our desires are our own. They arise spontaneously from within us. And objects have intrinsic value. I mean, this, this shoe was valuable in an obvious way. Everyone should be able right. to see important and valuable the shoe is, it, it has its own value. So normally we think that our desires just arise within us and are drawn to objects that have intrinsic value, right? Straight line. Mm -hmm. But where, if that's true, then where's the advertiser, you know, or where's that guy that touched the shoe on, in that? You have to make it the line into a triangle. Right. So at the top of the triangle is where Renee puts the mediator. Yep. So the the line, if there is one, uh, is the mediator is attracted, is pointing towards the object. Either casually, it could be a mistake that we think the mediator's interested, and then we follow the glance. Mm -hmm. the, you know, and we're like, oh, you want that? It must be really cool, especially if I admire you. Right. Yeah. And, and, like, who's and one of the interesting things about this is that the mediator is not just an individual, right? The mediator could be culture at large. Oh, right? absolutely. So uh, one of the one of the really interesting things about this is that a piece of paper is just a piece of paper, right? Unless you put something on it that says a hundred dollars, and then all yeah. of a sudden we all agree, oh, this is worth a hundred dollars. It's not just a piece of paper anymore. Right. Right. So this is this is cultural mediation telling us uh, what we all agree upon something is worth. Well, it's just a piece of paper. <laughs> right. Just a number. I mean, don't don't they say in advertising that you don't want to price your commodity too cheaply or people won't think it's valuable or it's not important enough. You right. Know? Yeah. You, you have to find that sweet spot where it's it's you price it well enough that it looks like it's desirable right it's important yes <laughs> yeah it's really interesting and which gets to the the point that gerard is making um we desire is not about acquiring things is about acquiring the qualities of being that the mediator has right so we um you know, we admire people for different reasons. They either seem cooler than we are or handsomer, or, you know, have a better career or better friends or whatever it is, you know. And so then we um, we make the mistake of thinking that if we get the same stuff they have, well, we'll be like them. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. You know, the, the, we, the desire makes the mistake of equating the object with the being of the mediator. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a big mistake that you need to become really conscious of or you get trapped. Right. Uh, and, you know, and what this points to, of course, is that um, we lack being. Human beings aren't born being somebody. You know, if you... You, you see an infant, they come with a certain genetic makeup and a certain physical disposition. Um, but to become, to, to, to become fully realized, they need to interact with the world. Mm -hmm. They need, their, their body needs to interact with the culture around them. And as you say, the culture is the mediator for a child. Um, the, the culture that child is born into gives them their desires. It's, it gives it's, their land. Yeah. Their it's funny because my daughter, what, she's seven, and um, she wants so desperately to be an adult, but she's so bad at it. 
she's like she wants to do the dishes but she doesn't wash her hands so i'm like no you can't you got to wash your hands before you put the dishes away <laughs> oh she tries yeah. so hard <laughs> she's trying but see she's imitating yes them. that's it she's learning her how to be as you say she's learning how to be in the world she's learning how to be an adult which is what her model is um it's the one who puts the dishes away yeah isn't that nice yeah eventually she'll be able to put the dishes away and i'll be so grateful <laughs> She will. She yeah. will. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she's doing it unconsciously. Children are just born with this d this drive right. uh, to meditation. Right. And um, the, the thing that is really interesting, you know, when people first hear this, that, you know, I lack being and my desires are not my own. I, you know, I get them from other people. It can be kind of a downer. Um, because of the culture we're born into, which really privileges autonomy and right. independence. Right. And anything that smacks of not being my own person, you know, uh, sounds negative. But it's really what makes us human and what makes human diversity and creativity so possible. I mean, if we were born with a given culture, and a given way of putting dishes away, or even of having dishes, or, right. you know, how and everything we wouldn't have this diversity of cultures we would be like instinctual animals that you know a cow is a cow cows don't have cultures you know they just because their desires are already attached to objects they just eat grass Our, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right they grass, you know yeah they're not gonna put a bernays sauce on it or a, you know a marinara or you know there, it, it, there's no creativity, there's no diversity. And so the thing that makes us so amazing as a, a, a species is that our lives are floating, they're unattached. Right. Right. Yeah. And so good thing, and I think Rene doesn't always emphasize that in, in his early works, um, but later he does point that out. Because in the early works, what he's really fascinated by is what the novelists are writing about, which is how desire brings us into conflict with one another. Mm -hmm. um, so the same thing that um, creates all this creativity and diversity can bring us into conflict. Um, but and and we'll track that. But the point is that Rene actually it was so this idea of being connected through desire to one another was so important that he says we're not individuals he coined a, a phrase with um a psychologist that he worked with um interdividual he says we're interdividual to just de-emphasize this ah, you know we're so independent and and our desires are our own he just wants us to flip our way of thinking 180 degrees um, it's it's a way of saying that we we are radically social creatures. There's yeah. this um, there's this African proverb or phrase that says uh, it's called Ubuntu. Have you heard of this? It's yes. it's it, it sums it up perfectly. It it basically says, uh, "I am because we are." Yeah. Right. And so this is this is basically what Gerard is getting at in mimetic theory. I don't exist apart from uh, the people around me, apart from culture. This is oh, uh, this is what individuality means, and Gerard is getting at it from uh, on a level of, of desire. Yeah, and he doesn't want us to be ashamed of it, you right. know. I think that's where we get in trouble, and that's where we're going to see the characters in these novels get into trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, when they deny their interdependence and that their desires are not spontaneous or original right. um and they become ashamed of it right and that gets in trouble so um let's look at external mediation which is the first big concept you know yes uh, in deceit desire in the novel um which starts with the triangle do you want to talk about the, you know, what makes makes external mediation? Well, external mediation is when uh, the mediator or your model is separated enough from you, uh, either mm, in historical time or uh, what um, 
in a level of uh, prestige uh, yeah. or geography. Um, and so you won't come into conflict with this person. So he uses uh, Don Quixote, right? Uh, yeah. Don Quixote is the classic uh, example of external mediation where Don Quixote, his model, his mediator is Amadis of Gaul. And uh, Amadis of Gaul is the great, uh, the great knight, right? The yeah. great model that Don Quixote wants to be like. And so he's, uh, uh, but Amadis of Gaul is a um, hundred years earlier or 200 years earlier, right? So he's, he's somebody from the past, right? Yeah. So he will never come into uh, conflict because they will never meet in real life. Right. This is what and, this is what external mediation uh, is is about. It's a model uh, that you will never come into conflict with, um, right? Because they're on different either social planes or uh, historical periods or live on opposite sides of the world. Yeah, yeah. I, I external. I, I always thought that was a slightly odd way to, you know, an odd name for it. But I, I just think of it as sort of someone who's external to your social. Yeah. And you're just not going to come in contact with them. Right. Um, and so let's, I, I really, you know, want to read this passage that um, Gerard opens the book with. He opens his book with a quote from Don Quixote. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we go through it um, and stop at certain points. We will get all the characteristics of external mediation. Right. It's yes. quite obvious. Um this is um, this is Don Quixote talking to his faithful sidekick, Sancho. Mm. He says, I want you to know, Sancho, that the famous Amadis of Gaul was one of the most perfect knight errants. A, a knight errant, you know, is, is a wandering hero. You know, just someone going around looking for people to save. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? um, he says, but what am I saying, one of the most perfect? I should say the only, the first, the unique, the master and lord of all those who existed in the world. Okay, so this is um, Don Quixote open, open about his imitation of Amadis of Gaul. He admires this guy, and he's not ashamed of it, and he's just declaring it. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just what it is. Open admiration. Open admiration, that's a, a, one of the big qualities of, of external mediation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here's the other one. So he goes on. He goes, look, when a painter wants to become famous for his art, he tries to imitate the originals of the best masters he knows. The same rule applies to the most important jobs or exercises. Thus, the man who wishes to be known as careful and patient mm -hmm. should and does imitate Ulysses in whose person and works Homer paints for us a vivid portrait of carefulness and patience. And it's understood that they depict them not as they are, but as they should be to provide an example of virtue mm -hmm. for to come. So here's the second quality, imitation. He openly admires and he openly imitates. Not ashamed. Um, and then... He goes on, um, in the same way, oh no, that's where I wanted to end for that quote. Um, well, a modern example of this, uh, when I was in high school, I would play basketball, and there were these Gatorade commercials, right, that were all about being like Michael Jordan, right? So they would yeah. say, I want to be like Mike. Right. Yeah, yeah. We would all like want to be like Mike, and we would we would do his moves where he'd go from right hand to left hand over here and stuff. Total sure. external mediation. Yeah. Because none of us were going to come into conflict or come into the social space of Michael Jordan, right? Right. And it was okay for us all to admire him openly because he was the best basketball player, and you wanted to be like Mike in this imitation. Yeah. And there's plenty of room for all of you to share that yes. desire. Another, no one was ever going to become get close. To, right. to yes, the, yes. So we're in the in the um, clearly in the realm of um, hero worship, mm -hmm. uh, discipleship, 
Um, you know, anytime you attach yourself to someone openly, say, I want to be like you, teach me to play the piano or, you know, teach me to, to dunk the ball or teach me whatever, um, you're in the realm of external mediation. Mm -hmm. um, of course, this is where hopefully our worship of God stays. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> where we don't come into competition with, with God. We acknowledge that God is greater than we are mm -hmm. most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes I don't know. Uh, sometimes I question. I, a lot of people seem to think they can do God's job better <laughs> than God can. But that's another, that's another video. That's the way it goes, yeah. Uh, so, so Renee says, the hero of external mediation oh. proclaims aloud the true nature of his desire. He worships his model openly and declares himself to be a disciple. Now, this is not terrible. Okay. Um, Gerard points out, in Cervantes, the mediator is enthroned in an inaccessible heaven. So, so there can't be conflict. And transmits to his faith for a faithful follower a little of his serenity. Hmm. So when you when you have a mediator who you can't come into conflict, you can possibly, um, you know, it, it can result in something good, something healthy, right. you know. Um, but it also um, don't. So so Cervantes carries this though out to its you know, logical extreme, if you will. So if you go to an extreme in, in external mediation, the whole world um, becomes um, colored or or painted with the desires of your mediator. Mm -hmm. So um, Don Quixote desires so much to be like a knight errant that he sees possibilities to be a knight everywhere, even in this famous example where a, a barber's basin looks like a helmet, a knight's helmet to him, and he, you know, wants to wear it, and he's trying to be a knight. Um, so what what Cervantes is pointing to is a risk that um, uh, the physical, the real world can become transfigured hmm. by our media, and that, um, as Rene says, desire can project a dream universe around the hero. So this is what's happened to Don Quixote. He's gone so far in surrendering his will and and all of his being over to Amadis that that he can't see see the world in front of him anymore. Right? Um, so it's it's um it, it, Renee says there would be no illusion if Don Quixote were not imitating Amadis. So I, th these are just really, to me, um, quite interesting um, and, and comes back to what advertisers do to us. They project, you know, this illusion uh, over the objects that they're trying to sell to us and transfigure them in our eyes. And that's why they can, we can become disappointed when we actually possess them and it's just a shoe, you know. And, and I still can't dunk like Michael Jordan, or I'm drinking Gatorade, and I still can't dunk like him. You know, so the, the illusion right. gets, uh, if we can still give primacy to our own experiences right. over, the, uh, right, the illusions of the, um, uh, uh, of our mediator. Um, and it's really interesting that um, the, the novels that, Gerard looks at here sort of follow a, a timeline you know because oh. you know Cervantes was writing in the when was Don Quixote was published in 1615 oh, okay that's a bit of a while ago right yes uh, and the kind of values that we have for e for equality were still sort of you know a glimmer in the eye of human culture at that point equality wasn't a huge value and god was not yet dead um so there was a lot of stratification a lot of ways in which your mediators could be separated from you mm -hmm. uh, so you wouldn't come in, into conflict with them um but here at the end of his life uh quixote does realize he's made a terrible mistake mm -hmm. Um, and that his, do you have that quote, Adam, you should read it. It's on, on 
page four of our notes. Um, and it, in the in the um, book, it's near the end of the novel. Uh, it's in the in, near the end of Deceit, Desire in the novel. Um, so Quixote says, at this time, my judgment is free and clear and no longer covered with a thick blanket of ignorance woven by my sad and constant reading of detestable books of chivalry. Ooh. I recognize their extravagance and trickery. My only regret is that my disillusionment has come too late and that I do not have time to make up for my mistake by reading other books which would have, to, which would have helped to enlighten my soul. I am the enemy of Amadis of Gaul. So this is the novelistic conclusion that Renee is going to find in other novels, this repudiation of uh, the deviated desire of following the wrong mediator, um, of attributing divinity to the wrong mediator, um, which, which gets us into internal mediation. And I think we can maybe do a little bit about internal mediation um, so we can get that idea out. Yeah, so external mediation, you don't come in conflict with your model uh, because of social space or history or geography, but internal mediation uh, is where you do come into conflict with your model, right? So uh, your, your desires uh, come into conflict. So uh, we desire what our models are pointing us to, but it's not about the object. As you say, it's about the other uh, and wanting to be like the other person because we're very social creatures. Um, and mm. so it doesn't really matter what the object is. What matters is who it is that we're in relationship with. Um, and if you're in relationship with someone and you're wanting the same thing, uh, whether it's... Uh, a physical object like, uh, I don't know, a jacket or a shoe, uh, or whether it's uh, what Gerard calls metaphysical object, like power or prestige, or mm -hmm. um, maybe a position, a new position at work opens up and you and someone else are both going after it. Um, this is what leads us into, into conflict, is internal mediation. It, right, right. And one of the, the first novel... Uh, in time that Rene deals with of internal mediation is this novel, The Red and the Black by Stendhal. Um, and that was written in 1830, which is 200 years after Don Quixote, right? Mm -hmm. So now what's happening to this vertically stratified society, all those mm, barriers to, to coming into direct conflict with your mediator are being eroded equality is the supreme value everyone has to be on the same plane and we we think equality is a good thing and it is it, ha it has created fantastic benefits for fundamentally uh, a good thing yes yeah for women needless to say equality has been incredibly important but the this strange thing is that you know it's got this sort of dark side to it mm -hmm. um because now we can come we're all mediators from one another we haven't stop needing mediators for desire right but we're all now our mediators are like right around us they're they're like you say at the next desk they're in the next room they're at the checkout line and why you know why do people get in fights on black friday and you know in if they feel insulted if someone cuts in front of them at the checkout this is these are all uh, manifestations of internal mediation um in which we're competing like for the same physical space, like the space in line or the space on the road and, and get ticked off, right. you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's just really interesting um, how, how conflict as, as modern life has evolved, the chances for internal mediation um, and conflict have risen. And this is well, this is one of the claims that Rene makes as he tracks these novels because the diseases of these characters, their what he calls their ontological illness or their soul sicknesses, you know, um, grow like these characters get sicker and sicker, if you will. 
Um, I, th- I think uh, we're seeing this play out on social media, Facebook and Twitter on a grand scale, right? I mean, nowhere else. This has probably led to where we can see this problem, the good of equality and also the, the problems with equality at the same time. So yeah. like anybody on Facebook or Twitter can now be a journalist, right? <laughs> Anybody on Facebook or Twitter can now be friends on a similar level as uh, a movie star or someone else. You can have thousands of followers. Um, And uh, you can also, you, so that's a good thing, but it's also can be a very dangerous thing because you can start to snowball with the conflict. right? Right. So, so once you can say something critical about someone or something nasty and it just goes, just snowballs. It does. It does. It really, and that, and what you're pointing out is that, um, we're all at the same sort of social level and in close proximity. And the, one of the emotions that's really sort of rampant, uh, in social media is hate, hatred. I mean, people love to hate and gang up together they form communities around who they hate right and um it's really odd it's an odd phenomenon that hatred is a relationship to your model right so before you could openly admire your model but when you can't openly admire uh, when you're ashamed of your admiration for them then you have this um you know, dual relationship. You have love and hate going on at the same time. I mean, this is called the model obstacle relationship. Again, another big word in mimetic theory. Um, We could look at, should we look at this example from the red and the black? Sure. Uh, I think I can do it pretty quickly. Go for it. Um, Or we could just go right to um, Marcel wanting to see the actress perform from um yeah do that from remembrance of things past i think that's a good one um i mean we can yeah um we can get at it all that way um so so in in the red in the black just to give you a hint on how you know what renee's doing there it it stendhal is looking at um internal mediation at the, in the public sphere you know like the the prestige that you want to be the most prominent person in town or you want to be the most popular one in your class right. these are full positions and so so stendhal his stendhal's novel is at that level uh in the social world and then when we move to proust to remembrance of things past now we're getting into the personal level mm-hmm. and at the level of the individual you get infected with mimetic desire very terrible um uh illnesses almost you know they're psychological illnesses yep. that come up H- hate hate being consumed by hate is one of them mm-hmm. uh, but also um it, what what you end up doing is giving up your uh, own experiences and the truth of your own experiences and surrendering them uh, to someone else's opinion. Mm. So um, it, let's look at this example because then it really explains it <laughs> better than that. Um, so there, they, this character, Marcel, is a young man, and he wants to go see a famous actress perform. Her name is Burma. Um, now, why does he want to see her perform? Because someone he admires wants to see her. He, this guy, Bergot, um, has written a booklet about how wonderful this actress is, and Gerard says that the printed words have a magical power of suggestion. And I think that's a great way to think about the effect of a mediator in internal mediation. It's like you're under hypnosis Mm -hmm. and a hypnotic spell, right? Um, 
And Gerard tells us that Marcel hopes to accrue these spiritual benefits from the performance and that this of a truly sacramental type, right? So here we're, we're understanding, we're seeing that um, Marcel is after something that he feels he's, he doesn't possess. And he's trying to fill an emptiness he has. Um, and where is he looking to fill the emptiness? So, we, so in the earlier novels, people are choosing models because they have desires and qualities that are very admirable. Now, the quality that seems to be admirable is not having any desires at all, hmm. of being fully satisfied, of being above the fray. You know, this actress, I'm sure, who acts like we, you know, we see the models in the magazines look with disdain out at us, you know. I know you're looking at me, but I could care less. Right, yes. You know. Um, and so this is the quality uh that becomes very desirable and it's this kind of weird thing because um, it, you're setting yourself up to want the approval of someone who by definition claims not to want to give their approval or need it, you know. And the more they walk away from you, the more you want their approval. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yeah. And you, you begin to confuse the difficulty of acquiring the object with the divinity that you're after this, you know, right. uh, possession of some being. Um, and so, you know, oh, I mean, this, this quote, um, you know, Renee says that the, the vain person, this is um, a, a, a term that um, Stendhal uses, the vain person feels the emptiness mentioned in Ecclesiastes growing inside him, and he takes refuge in shallow behavior and imitation. Because he cannot face his nothingness, he throws himself on another who seems to be spared by the curse. And this is the descent into uh, internal mediation that really, um, you know, plagues the individual. So Burma is transfigured in the same way that for Don Quixote, the barber's bowl was transfigured into a helmet, you know. Yeah. This woman is transfigured into the source of all being, which is, excuse me, that's God. You know, so um, it, this is a, what Rene calls a deviated transcendency, you know, mm -hmm. a mis- um, and so just to emphasize the power of Bergot to transfigure objects, Proust um, just throws this little description of Marcel being bored by walking along the Champs-Élysées. And he says, oh, if only Bergot had described the place in one of his books, I should no doubt have longed to see it and right. to know it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's funny, but it's, it's also very sad, you know. Um, and then, so then what happens is um, Marcel goes to see this woman perform. And what does he experience? Disappointment. Yeah. Inspires remorse, you know. She wasn't that good. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't get any sense of spiritual fulfillment. There is no sacramental quality, nothing. So uh, he goes back you know, back and talking about the performance, and he actually says, yeah, she's, I was disappointed. You know, she wasn't that good. Well, all the, the people around him say, oh, no, no, you're Fantastic. not. You're, he, she is amazing. Mm -hmm. By the end of the conversation, he has abandoned his own experience and said, oh, yeah, you know, you're right. He, I... I will accept your version of what happened and abandon mine. And this is the, you know, um, when Proust is, is entitling his different books, you know, Remembrance of Things Past and Recovering Past, what he's talking about is recovering your experiences before you had surrendered your um, 
autonomy to your models. Oh, well, I mean, that, that experience with, um, who was that at that, that, that experience is just showing how powerful the pull of the crowd is. Oh yeah. So I want to be a part of, um, whatever group it is that I identify with. And I, um, on, you know, my worst days, <laughs> will give up my experience of things that I remember from the past in order to be part of the crowd, in order to be accepted. Um, and not even on my worst days, you know, I, I do that quite frequently, especially as we were talking about Facebook. It is so hard on Facebook when people are piling on the voice of the crowd, they're piling on in order to think, I think something's wrong with this, <laughs> but I don't want to defend anyone because I'm afraid I'm going to be the one who's piled on next. So, so true. You don't want to make a peep, but you can see that the crowd really wants you to be part of it because mm -hmm. someone who's standing outside the crowd is a little bit of, um, you know, a reality check on the crowd. And they don't, you know, it. you don't want any other divergent opinions. Everyone should right. agree because it's an illusion. And if right. you know, someone's going to break the spell... Uh, they're going to ruin. They're going to ruin the illusion, and I think that's the um, that's what Proust is pointing to here. Um, and again, I think we just want to emphasize that it's not imitation that's the problem, and it's not desire that's the problem. The problem is when we um, when we deny that that our desires are imitated, and that. Also, when we pretend that, that when we're ashamed of that. Right. Um, and then we hide from the truth and then we get tr sucked into this delusional world in which reality, we just lost touch with reality. That's why this whole truth conversation that's going on right now, you know, we're post-truth, it's fake news, it's what's, how do we know the truth? Well, we're all sort of in this world of internal mediation where we're all... Um, it, under each other's spell, if you will, mm. um, and under the spell of different crowds, so that reality is is a law. It is true. We have lost touch with reality, um, and uh, we're we're captive to the mimetic emotions, which are envy, resentment, and hatred. Yep. I mean, hey, social media. Yep. yep. That's politics. Yep. Yep. With the po hatred of group hatred and whatever. It's just it's horrible. Mm -hmm. And of course, the 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 worst uh, um, example of this illness is um, in Notes from Underground by Dostoevsky. Did you ever read that? Uh, no. Notes from Underground. I am. This is a man who is so consumed with resentment mm. that he and is so lost touch with reality that if someone looks at him sideways he takes it as an insult Oof. and he gets obsessed with vengeance over nothing i mean nothing has happened <laughs> and he's obsessed with it and i i read this when i was in high school yeah and um i almost made the mistake marcel made of coming into class and and giving my honest opinion because i thought finally someone is telling the truth about how i feel yeah <laughs> i was totally this frightened, scared, a person afraid of being ridiculed. Mm. And I saw in every little glance or little side thing, someone who, who they, they must hate me. And, and I would just run frightened and scared and everything. I'm like, finally, someone's writing about this. And then I go into class, of course, and they're talking about how crazy the underground man is. <laughs> the teachers are saying, no, he's insane. It's pathological. Oh. I'm like, Thank God I didn't say anything. Or 15-year-old Suzanne. Oh. I would have been committed. You, are, you would right. not have seen it. I mean, but it's, it, is a, it is a pathology of desire. It really is. But we're all susceptible to it. Mm -hmm. um, and especially young people. Oh, oh. my God. Oh. Especially young people. That's it's just, just high school. But as, as, you were, as you were talking, I was like, oh, my gosh, that's just Facebook. Like, you know, just goes, <laughs> all, like Facebook is like the... Petri dish for all of this. <laughs> for all of it, yeah. 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 You know, 
There's no, that's the thing. At the, at the root of all our desires is the desire to be, to belong, mm -hmm. to be loved, to be part of something. And that's all good. Right. It's all The problem is when we get, um, we put our faith in the wrong mediators. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, um, Renee's, there's a famous line from Renee's novel, and it is about um, how men will become gods for one another. When, when we're all equals, when we're all mediating for one another, and we can't figure out who to follow, and, and, um, and when God is dead, you know, we're all now, we are all gods for one another, because someone has to teach us what to desire. Well, this is why Renee received so much criticism uh, from the academy is because uh, he took he took Jesus seriously. Yeah, no, he did. So, the Bible's like in the first like couple pages of this book. He says he says you follow Jesus. Like that's that's the answer to all of this, right? <laughs> For Renee is uh, it the freedom that we have is in choosing who our models will be. Exactly. We'll always have models that that we follow, uh, but our freedom is in who, who we're going to choose to be. That's why Jesus puts such a great emphasis on saying, follow me. Yeah. If you don't follow me, you're going to be following something else, whether you realize it or not. Um, so follow me as we uh, create the kingdom of God. Follow me as we live into the spirit of love. Yeah, the, the, the quote here from To Seek Desire in the novel is, choice always involves choosing a model. Mm -hmm. And true freedom lies in the basic choice between a human or a divine model. Mm -hmm. So the divine model he, he calls vertical transcendency, right? Yep. And the human model is deviated transcendency. We're mistaking other people for the divine model. We're, we're viewing them with the divinity they don't possess. Right. Right. No. Um, and so this is, so here we brought, we brought ourselves to the conclusion of novelists' conclusions mm. <laughs> that um, we need to be able to, um, to see the truth of our desire and to renounce the false deviated transcendencies, the false models. And accept the fact that we are desiring beings, we're imitative beings, and that's okay. It's, it's a, okay. It's Ubuntu. I am because we are. <laughs> Ubuntu. <laughs> right. And then the hero of the novel uh, is the one who can then look back on his life and make a comparison. Hmm. And so that the role of the mediator comes into view, where before he thought, you know, he was making his own choices and was free and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so Renee says, you know, novels are all about the same thing, revealing the role of the mediator, hmm. and the conclusions are all the same. Renouncing deviated transcendency and finding a truly divine, a truly divine model. Uh, deviated transcendency is the same thing as internal mediation. Yeah, it's it's mistaking uh, one another. It's when we become gods for one another. Yeah. Yeah. When we allow, uh, you know, someone else to tell us uh, to transfigure reality and make it radiate with a divinity it doesn't have. Yeah, and that's when we're disappointed and when we get resentful and hateful and. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Well, hey, yeah. the good news is that we just got 95 pages of Deceit Desire in the novel, and we've got another 150 to go for yeah. for next month. For next month. And I think what, what I was we've been talking about doing is really getting into um, how this all applies to our uh, our real lives and, and looking at politics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Privilege, this whole conversation around privilege, yeah. check your privilege and all of that, and love. Aww. And 
look at politics, privilege, and love, and how understanding the role of models in, um, in desire helps us escape from some of the pitfalls we're experiencing in, uh, in those areas. So next month in December, we'll do this all again with uh, the last 150 pages of Deceit, Desire, in the novel. We'll do politics. And what were the other ones? Politics and... Privilege. Privilege. And love. And love. That's cute. And it's going to be December, so maybe we'll talk about Christmas or something. Oh, we must. Because love. So, awesome. Hey. Because love Thank you, Suzanne. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Um, we'll do this again next month, so keep up with the Raven Foundation Facebook page for more information on uh, our next live chat. Excellent. Awesome. Until Thank then, peace be with you. Bye-bye. <laughs>